Majority of Christians will not enter God's kingdom for one reason. Here is why. It's because they are living their lives according to the standard of this world. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, we read, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The scripture makes it clear that as Christians, we should not follow the standard of this world, but to be in a different mindset that we may know what is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse number 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Most claims to be Christians today, but are you doing the will of God or are you following the standard of this world? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. So what is the will of God? We need to understand what the will of God is in order for us to be able to do it. Well, I'd like to take you on a journey so that you may fully understand what the will of God truly is. Let's start with Hebrews chapter 11, verse number five. The Bible says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. The Lord took Enoch to heaven because he pleased him. So how did Enoch please the Lord? That's how we get to understand what the will of God is. In verse number six of Hebrews chapter 11, we read, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. According to this verse, we understand Enoch had faith, which also mentioned in verse number five of Hebrews chapter 11. Now we need to understand where faith come from. The answer is found in Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, which said, so then faith cometh by hearing in hearing by the word of God. So based on what we just read here, it is evident that we must spend time reading the word, hearing the word from others, quoting the word, etc., in order for us to have faith, in order for our faith to grow. The very first sermon Jesus preached saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's in Mark chapter 1, verse number 15. So how can we have faith, repent, and believe the word of God if we don't make it our priority to study it? And if we fail to study the word of God, how could we possibly know what the will of God is? Again, what is the will of God? Well, here it is. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 3, the Bible says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. The will of God is for us to be sanctified and abstain from sin. In other words, we need to be morally right, even holy, as the Lord himself is holy. There is only one way to be sanctified, my friends. And this is found in the book of John chapter 17, verse number 17, which said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. It is only through the word of God, which is Jesus, can we be sanctified. In other words, if you truly repent and believe the gospel, you will do exactly what it says. Are you? Are you doing what the word of God command us to do? Now, let's deal with fornication. Fornication is sin, according to Exodus 20, verse 14. So we need to understand what sin is. The book of 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committed sin transgress also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In a nutshell, the will of God is to believe and have faith in his son Jesus Christ, the word, to repent from sin and abstain from it, to be pure in mind, and to set ourselves aside wholly unto the Lord. My friends, the world is promoting everything that keeps us from the will of the Lord, such as adornment, 
tight clothing that reveal every curve on your body, fake hair, secular music, foods that are detrimental to your health, worldly movies, worldly conversation, unbiblical divorce, gossiping, men braiding their hair, growing dreads, body piercing, the list goes on. All these things Satan bring into the world as distraction just to keep us from entering the kingdom of God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15 and verse number 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Have you noticed what is happening in the world these days? Evil men and seducers are doing all they could in their power to squeeze us out of every bit of our God-giving freedom. And you're still snowing. When will you wake up, my friends? The time is now to turn from this deceptive, immoral, draconian world and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. Probation is fast closing. Friends and families, I love you too much not to shake you up out of this slumber. I know this is a mouthful to give up everything you ever know in this world, but it's all a lie. The sooner you come to the truth, the sooner you will realize everything we've just shared. Please do not procrastinate. God bless. I believe we are facing a sinister threat to the freedoms and everyday liberties that we and our grandparents have taken for, and our parents have taken for granted all our and their lives, but are being squeezed out of us by woke left-wing authoritarian governments. And if we don't wake up soon and start saying no, it will be too late. Yesterday, I read a very disturbing story that comes out of Oxfordshire in Britain, but it offers a terrifying glimpse into what the future, the net zero future, could well look like under the climate renewables tyranny. According to Darren Burks at the independent website Vision News, and you can also read the same story on the Daily Skeptic, an excellent website, the Joe Nova blog, and elsewhere. Oxford County Council are planning on embarking in 2024, not on COVID lockdowns, but as I and many others have long predicted, climate lockdowns. Yes, folks, the Great Reset is going to begin in earnest among the dreamy spires of Oxford, once the very centre of learning and enlightenment in the English-speaking world. How will it work? Well, scarily, much of the infrastructure of oppression and surveillance is already in place, as it is here. But recently, Oxford County Council started to spell out the details. And yes, it's all being done in the name of saving the planet from climate change. According to Vision News, last week, Oxfordshire County Council finally approved their plans to lock residents into one of six zones across the city of Oxford. They have divided the city, this is the council, into six zones as the latest stage in what is called the 15-minute city agenda. Remember that phrase. And they are actually boasting about this agenda. According to an October article in the Oxford Mail, the local newspaper there, quote, Duncan Enright, Oxfordshire County Council's Cabinet Member for Travel and Development Strategy, has explained how roadblocks stopping most motorists from driving through Oxford City Centre will divide the city into six 15-minute neighbourhoods. He insists the controversial plan will go ahead whether people like it or not. There's your COVID mentality at work. The Oxfordshire Council will place electronic gates on key roads in and out of the city, confining residents to their own neighbourhoods. Even the Times newspaper has reported on this travesty without batting an eyelid that motorists will be fined simply for leaving their neighbourhood once too often. So, how does this communist-style activity work in what is supposedly the heart of a liberal democracy? Well, here's how the boffins explain it. 
every resident will be required to register their car with the county council who will then monitor how many times they leave their district via number plate recognition cameras. People can drive freely around their own neighbourhood and must apply for a permit to drive through the filters and into other neighbourhoods which they can apply to for up to 100 days per year. The council will then track their movements via smart cameras positioned all around the city. If any of Oxford's 150,000 residents drives outside of their designated district more than 100 days in the year, he or she can be fined $150 a pop. So what exactly is a 15-minute city? The term was coined in 2016 by Sorbonne, Sorbonne professor Carlos Marino, who was given a Nobel Award in 2021 for developing his idea. I'll bet he was. The lovies lapped it up. Quote, a truly livable and sustainable urban future that places each global citizen at the heart of their own city, was the gushing blurb. When they say places each global citizen at the heart of their own city, of course, I suspect what they really mean is imprisons each global citizen within five kilometres of their own home. Unsurprisingly, we find the concept enthusiastically being sold by Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. The same mob who hope that by 2030 you will own nothing and you will be happy have even gone to the trouble of drawing you up a cute little diagram of your wonderfully new virtual prison to make the idea look benign and appealing, as well as a funky interactive World Economic Forum graph, Klaus loves these things, where you can learn that urban resilience, for example, is linked to climate change, cyber security and, of course, systemic racism. All the usual lefty nonsense and garbage designed to keep individuals locked down and denied freedom of movement, the most fundamental and precious of all our human rights, and the most basic one at that. As Joanna Nova says on the excellent Joe Nova website, the 15-minute city is now already being eagerly embraced by the United Nations to tackle climate change, of course as well by a host of city councils and local governments all around the world, including popping up in Barcelona, Paris, Portland, Buenos Aires, and even Brisbane and Melbourne. Yes, they're everywhere. Interesting, isn't it? How all these different uh, cities all around the world seem to be kind of hopping on the same bandwagon all at the same time. It's almost as if, oh, I don't know, we un had one big government running the world behind the scenes, telling all the little governments, you know, the democratically elected ones, what to do. Of course, I'm only joking. That could never happen, could it? Here's French President Emmanuel Macron at the recent APEC conference Albo scurried off to attend. Are you on the US and the Chinese side? Because now, progressively, a lot of people would like to see there, there are two orders in this world. This is a huge mistake, even for both the US and China. We need a single global order. Whoa, hang on, Emmanuel, you're way behind the eight ball there, mon vieux. According to our own chief health officer here in New South Wales, we've already got one. Um, we will be looking at what contact tracing looks like in the new world order. Anyway, certain folk here in Australia are getting extremely excited about the idea of the 15-minute city. The Brisbane Times were most enthusiastic. Quote, the concept of a city in which work, play and most of life's necessities are within 15 minutes of home, on foot or by bicycle, gained traction during the pandemic. And today, cities around the world, including London, Milan and Paris, are embracing the idea. I'll bet they are. We are marching headlong into a world of technocratic tyranny and control over our daily lives that is anathema to the spirit of liberty and democracy. 
where even local government bureaucrats, let alone big government mandarins, control and survey our every movement.